Can I just um, make a couple of points because we talk about how it's going to operate and so on and we tend to just assume that the benefits of the APL, and the National Competition Review, are, are, are just well accepted. But I think it's worthwhile just to reiterate the benefits that will come out of this. Um, benefits for players and parents, of course, of players and benefits for clubs. And if I can just outline some of them so that it's put into context. Um, the, the criteria that are, uh, will be applied will provide for players, for the talented players, better coaching and a better youth development system in the clubs in which they're, they're uh, going to. So it's expected that the talented players will uh, be in um, uh, APL clubs and uh, benefit from the stronger youth development and coaching systems that are there. Um, they'll also benefit from the continuity of being able to be in a club from the, uh, the time that they begin their serious football career at age 13 all the way up to seniors. Uh, that's uh, a benefit that's not obvious, uh, but it, 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 a, a player won't feel the need to be moving clubs um, as he develops through his football career. Um, the criteria also will produce more transparency um, uh, from the clubs about fees in particular. And the uh, criteria such as the players' uh, player point system uh, is designed to uh, make it less likely that clubs will pay significant amounts to senior players for which the junior payers, players now end up paying. So there's significant financial benefits for the individuals uh, concerned. Um, the criteria also will require, as you heard, that the clubs have got strong governance systems to the benefit of their players. And it'll provide quality competition for the players. Uh, these things are maybe obvious, but I think they're worth stating. For the clubs to be part of the APL, the Australian Premier League, there's significant benefit. First of all, there will be a consistent brand across Australia, and we, uh, FFA, will be doing a lot to promote that brand quite actively and uh, quite high profile, so that the Australian Premier League will be known throughout the country as being uh, the uh, the league that it is underneath the A-League where uh, talented players and top-class competition is available and played. Um, eventually, we expect that there'll be some commercial advantages from a consistent common brand across the whole country. Um, it won't happen uh, in the first year, uh, but we expect that it'll be commercially uh, attractive for uh, pe uh, um, corporates to be associated with the Australian Premier League. Um, it's important that clubs will be recognised as being part of the talented player pathway that will attract the talented players to those clubs and uh, the kudos that attaches to a club that's known as, as being an accredited APL club uh, is something that I think clubs will be happy about. There's quite some significant other um, advantages um, for the teams from uh, APL clubs. First of all, in the FFA Cup, uh, the, um, prim the APL clubs will come into the FFA Cup at a later part of the, um, of the FFA Cup. Uh, they, the a-League clubs will come in the last, the, FF, uh, the um, APL clubs the second last, and all other uh, clubs with senior teams will uh, commence at an earlier stage of the FFA Cup knockout system. And the other thing that is being discussed amongst um, uh, Football Queensland and the other member federations uh, that they're quite keen on is for there to be a Champions League uh, competition at the end of each season between the top APL clubs from each state. Uh, so there'll be an Australian Champions League out of the state APL clubs. So th these are some of the benefits that we tend to talk about, the criteria, um, 
how it's going to happen, the difficulties, but I thought it's worthwhile to mention some of the benefits. Thanks, John. Trish? Yeah. Um, just a question about the training compensation scheme. I don't know if you can um, tell me, but you were saying that the board of FFA is going to um, look at it over the next few days. Monday, I think. Tuesday, uh, Monday. Monday. And then will there be, do you think, an announcement and um, any sort of document where we can look at what um, the training compensation will entail? Um, just for two reasons. I mean, it's a very good idea, but also I'm personally interested in um, if there's compensation for the girls that go through the APL clubs uh, as well, or is it just at this stage compensation for the boys that go through the APL clubs? Uh, compensation only applies to um, professional contracts where a professional contract is granted. If there are professional contracts granted for girls, then the FIFA rules apply to girls as well. Oh, uh, I thought the diagram showed that there's some compensation when those players have um, then go into national uh, training uh, programs. No, no. What happened, what that w is about is that previously, say a player went overseas and attracted training compensation, some of that training compensation was going to the NTC or the AIS. So they were being treated like clubs and getting money, um, being recognised as having developed the player who then went overseas. That's stopping the QAS will no longer receive training compensation. It'll go to the accredited clubs instead. So if a player moves from pillar three to pillar two and goes into the QAS, uh, they will still be treated as coming from the club that they came from, and that club will get the training compensation rather than the QAS. There's no training compensation paid by the QAS um, or the AIS. Uh, it's it's um, when somebody goes on a professional contract that training compensation uh, develops. So, is um, are there professional contra contracts in the W League? No, there are there are some um, um, payments made of something like you know a few hundred dollars a week, but there's not it's not um, it's not uh, uh, similar to the men's. The other thing about the W League is that it's a short league and the players are available for their other clubs for the rest of the season anyway, so there, there's no need to compensate the other clubs. Okay, so the, in summary, um, APL clubs won't ever really be compensated for the training provided to the girls because the girls don't end up with professional contracts. Um, if, if, a, if a girl goes overseas to a professional contract, um, the, and, and, and more and more are actually mm. um, the training compensation if, if, if the um, overseas club is paying training compensation it will come to the benefit of the clubs from which the girls came and, and the training compensation under the FIFA rules goes to all the clubs to which, from which the, uh, the, 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 the player was uh, part of from age 12 upwards right but the proportion will be weighted in favor of the APL clubs mm. because that's where the youth development this is they're going to be the ones who are doing the substantial youth development the the clubs underneath the A-league clubs from which a player came say when he or she was 12 or 13 will still get some compensation but it'll be weighted towards the accredited APL clubs and so, yeah, last. I, I don't know of any training compensation that's ever been paid for a female in Australia no. um, <laughs> as yet, but more and more of them are taking um, are taking uh, professional contracts sure. overseas. So, will there be sort of a document available, or, or uh, on on Monday our board uh, is um, uh, considering it and hopefully making a decision. We then uh, uh, under our current situation have to refer it to the JALSC, which is the Joint A-League uh, Standing Committee, because it will affect uh, what A-League clubs uh, have to pay in training compensation as well. So we've got that element of consultation to do yet. But there will be a document in due course and not too far away. Brian? Yeah. 
And uh, are you going to get on to the financial aspects of uh, the APL? I know we've talked a lot of other stuff, but I can do. for clubs, essentially, we need to know what the financial model needs to be so that yeah, sure. we well, can see if we can afford it or not. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, no and, doubt. And, and the second part of that is um, talk about uh, player payments from other states. Um, within our own Brisbane competition here, we don't have, as I'm aware, uh, Mike might tell me, but there's no professional contracts within this level, yeah. and therefore the player payments aren't, aren't massive amounts of money hmm. in, in real terms. Um, you know, we're not talking like 50, 60,000 a year for a player or something, but um, whereas there might be in other states, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yes, there are, there are player payments made, but I don't know if, hmm. if they were exorbitant in Brisbane or not. Hmm. But, uh, but please, yeah, the financial point is very critical for yeah. all the clubs to understand. Yeah, and I've spoken to most of the clubs, probably. Um, in relation to uh, the club technical director, Football Queensland will fund $40,000 towards the club technical director. Uh, okay, I'll ask a question. Is that for the first year or is that no, no, ongoing? No, it's ongoing because there's some responsibilities that, that will ask that club technical director and the licensee to fulfil as part of the APL um, licence. Um, so that's that's one component. Um, clubs in South East Queensland, from a travel point of view and accommodation, will have their travel and accommodation capped at $10,000, meaning that that's all the bill they'll get for the year. Um, in relation to apparel, we're trying to tie down some, some exclusivity deals in relation to apparel for the league, um, and we'll make that available once we were able to do so. Um, what have I missed? They're, they're the real key components at the moment. Um, coach education will provide uh, some courses, four, four courses at B and C level at a reduced rate, uh, which is a really important phase of the APL. Um, but happy to, happy to go through each individual uh, yeah, section. What about guidelines for pa uh, paying coaches right throughout the whole range of teams? Well, we haven't put any in place at, at, as yet. Um, and I don't know whether that's something that's come up in other states, but um, I know but it's, not a bad it, it's it's something that that's come up from other well, clubs. Well, uh, when you start talking B licenses and yep. A licenses, well, coaches will be wanting more money for sure, reaching yeah. those levels. And if you're talking about B licenses throughout, right up to you know from the twelves upwards, yeah, these guys aren't going to be, um, you know, they're accredited coaches. They'll be wanting to look at a reasonable. Return we might do payment. something about that Eventually. and get it out next week. If we I mean, can. you could be looking yeah. a lot of money in just coaches' pay, play, uh, payments compared to what we, all the Brisbane clubs are experiencing right now. Sure. In the JPLs, um, you know, we, we the C licence, am I right, big JPLs? Um, and, you know, there is some compensation for that, but it's not a huge amount of money. That question did come up in Victoria, and what we found from the analysis we did in Victoria, particularly around the number of coaches that were accredited, was that there were very few B licensed and C licensed coaches that actually had positions within clubs. So therefore the clubs were paying more money for those coaches because it was yes. unique. However, in an environment where we're saying that all clubs have to have C's and B's and that where we do actually have in some states a lot of coaches that are struggling to get access to um, coaching positions at the highest level, um, that's an element that we, we need to consider as well. So that has come up, but obviously we have to look at the current environment in comparison to an environment where you're well, going to have well, more B's and yeah. C's and therefore what I'll they can you, command needs I'll to right be now, more ben realistic. In Queensland, how many B licensed coaches do we have in the whole of Queensland? Would there be more than 20? Yeah. yeah. yeah Good. Definitely. And that's something that we've talked but, about. But is are providing they able to go to all the clubs because that's yeah, the point. Oh, you know, I mean, we're talking a statewide, it's a big state. Yeah. Yeah, the the present the spreadsheet I've seen is uh, yeah B and C coaches. There's there's plenty in Queensland. You could probably do some additional analysis, which actually looks at where those coaches yeah, are well located. That's, that's what I'm getting that's at, because if, if you're talking about five teams in Brisbane alone, and you're talking about at least two of those coaches being B licensed, you know, your, your DOC and your and your top uh, team coach. Well, that's yeah. ten coaches they're required straight away in Brisbane. If you've got more than say just twenty in the state and you've got them spread around, you've got to move people from Cairns down here, they're going to be wanting money. Yeah. They're not going to move 
2,000 kilometres for nothing. But I think the approach should be twofold. One is that we actually look at the current coaches that are qualified and, and try to target those coaches to, to come into the APL teams. But the other element is that you do have coaches that are within your club set up um, that you would like to continue to engage with. Then, then obviously looking at the strategies around holding Bs and Cs to ensure that those current coaches can access those courses. So there's really a kind of twofold approach that's been taken in most states around that. Yeah, but you see, not all the clubs in Brisbane have those. Uh, you know, I mean, we're quite a the Brisbane club scenario is quite diverse in its in its uh, entities. There's some clubs that are quite quite uh, play high quite quality football, but mm. their facilities and their backing isn't that that great financially. Mm. And there's other clubs that have got a bit more uh, facilities and better financials that that attract some other coaches. So I mean, it's a spread of what we have here in Brisbane. But, but equally, we can target coaches that are currently in the setup to attend courses and look at providing incentives around discounts around that as well. Okay. Additionally, internally, you know, we talk about this, Dave, all the time about our B and C uh, licensed coaches, and you know, in the last three or four months, there's been probably ten or fifteen coaches that are looking for jobs within APL clubs that have contacted us that are B and C licensed. Um, Wondering when the licence or when, when the licensees are coming out. So, uh, so there's plenty of plenty of people that want to get into. Yeah, but, yeah, I agree with you there, and that's that's a very good setup. But again, the financial side needs to be look targeted because and, if and in relation to, to that, um, <laughs> the coaching courses are quite expensive at the moment, yes, they are. and that's because the coaching courses are primarily directed towards people who want to be full-time professional coaches. We recognise that in the APL, um, especially at the younger ages, many of the coaches will be part-time or, or voluntary. So that's why the cost of doing the courses for APL clubs will be substantially reduced. I'm not talking about a 10 or 15% discount. We're talking about more like uh, half cost and we'd be encouraging clubs to also contribute towards the cost of their coaches being... Um, the ideal scenario would be that FFA would pay half the cost of the coaching course, club the club, club a quarter, and the, and the coach himself a quarter, and that will reduce it substantially, because we recognise the guys who will come... who you've currently got yeah. are not full-time coaches, and <coughs> it's not, for example, tax deductible for them. But that also lends itself to uh, uh, when where the courses are held. I, I believe there's a B licence course coming up in Brisbane mm -hmm. in January. Uh, that's probably the only one that I'm aware of in, in local terms. Most of them may be down in Sydney or something. They Up until now, um, up until two years ago, you had to go to Sydney or Canberra for all the courses. We've decentralised the C licence courses and this year we've been decentralising the B licence courses so they can be held where the coaches are and coaches not having to travel to go to them. Um, it, it, coaching education is such a vital part of it, we've got to, we've got to make it more accessible. With respect to you said that there's going to be an end of year competition or an, like an Champions FFA, League style, well an FFA type <laughs> club competition. Mm. Will the A League clubs be limited to to Visa players as against the five that they currently have? So it's an even playing field. For the Champions League, what, what no, no, for the FFA Cup. Yeah, for the FA, FFA Cup. So. Are you wanting to use the state leagues as a fodder for the A-League or is it going to be an even playing field? I think Man U field a full team against Scunthorpe in the Yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the idea is to get, you know, the, the, comp the opportunity to play against the A-League clubs. If I, if I was a kid playing in that, um, in that club, playing against the likes of the Brisbane Raw, I'd be wanting to play against those, the best players, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, so but I'd say... I'd say I'm asking a question because I've been asked to ask a lot of oh. questions. <laughs> then yes, mate. Yeah, I'd say they'd. Be, I, I would think. And can he sit next to you? I would think. Uh, um, you know, they'd they'd look at something like that for sure. Ben, um, Han mentioned the importance of all working together to make this successful, hmm. and I think we all recognise that. And I think I don't know what process has been in, put in place for FFA to work with Football Queensland and Football Queensland to work with Football Brisbane. Mm. Um, but obviously something good's <coughs> happening there. How are we going to get um, 
APL clubs supported by the zone clubs, the clubs within their zones, to ensure that the best players do move into that. Um, obviously, given the history and um, yep. the concerns there, what strategies are there going to be put in place for that? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want to stop it from happening and sure. don't support it. Um, and I don't know if you guys have come across this in other states where community clubs have have, have stopped players going to JPL competitions or um, or the like, and that, I guess that's what one of the challenges up in in Queensland will be. Um, if if I'm a feeder club to to an APL club, why am I releasing my my player? I guess to to that club. Um, one of the roles that we'll work with our, our new state technical director, once he's employed, we'll work with the club technical directors and one of their roles that will be to come in here, I'd say, for a week, work with us and work out strategies in and around working with the community clubs. And it's not about just going and taking their best players, you know. From a, from a president's and board point of view at, at Clubland, you know, they need to build these relationships with the community clubs. Um, and you know, offer incentives for those clubs. What they are and how they look like, we'll work with the, the, the clubs to, uh, to make sure we get it right. But no doubt, Paul, there'll be some challenges to start with. But one of the roles of the APL club is to make sure that they understand the pathway as well and they understand the curriculum. And hopefully, you know, 10, 20 years' time, we're all playing the curriculum, you know? That question has come up in Victoria from the um, consultations that I've been involved in and one of the strategies that will be adopted there is actually trying to educate the community clubs yeah. in regards to their role uh, within within the pathway as well because obviously it is an important one. So that could be a strategy that could be adopted, Ben, is to look at having some maybe open forums for community clubs to also ask some questions about how they can feed into the process as well. Yeah, I, I just think like the community clubs are the first step, so they're the, probably the most important um, and for them to know that their their role in the whole process is very important as well. Yeah, and uh, something that sits aside this is um, we have a national uh, club accreditation scheme for community clubs, uh, which again looks to recognise and reward those clubs um, for the work that they're doing at the grassroots level to provide quality opportunities for young players. So that's something that certainly should be promoted as part of this with the community clubs as well. And I think we just need to keep our communication going, Paul, with this, you know, like... You were there last night and uh, you saw 160-odd parents hear what we had to say and a lot of them hadn't heard it before. Um, equally, we've got a responsibility in Clubland to make sure we're pushing the message as well. So, um, you know, there's key, key people out in Clubland, our club technical directors, our, our boards, uh, making sure that they, they're talking to, to their neighbours as well, so the feeder clubs underneath them. just want to pass it over to Pete. Uh, the reality of, as a QSL club mm. that we've had is that as we've progressed in the QSL over the last four and a half, five years, mm. is that, and of course we have our youth teams, um, the number of players that we have trialling for our positions, and no disrespect to our local clubs, because we have good relationships actually with quite mm. a few of them, and we work hard in our community, but the kids are driven by the pathway. Mm. It's not the clubs mm. per se pushing mm. them to us. Maybe mm. it's mum and dad. Mm. Um, but those players are turning it up at our door. The last year's trial for our youth team saw mm. 65 players mm. for about six positions. And probably 30, 30 of them could have played our football. Mm. So the greatest challenge for us is actually picking the players mm. um, to play in our squads that we think have got the greatest potential. The greatest challenge is is actually you know getting it right yep. and so and i want to make this point the point that was made before about us playing in competitions in the local league we've sought to bring shadow groups of players into our local competition on the sunshine coast At, for example a reserve grade 17s playing reserve grade no points no trophies we'll fund it we'll yep. run it we're there just for development yeah and we've applied on two occasions the local zones it gets stuffed mm. um you're not playing <clears throat> because because of an attitude, I suppose. Yeah. But the reality is we could have placed at least another 20 players um, yeah. and kept developing those players. Mm. And our squad this year has players in it, and, and the majority of them for our under-19s are 16 mm. or 17. Mm. So we've taken a, uh, an approach, which is a longer-term 
um, uh, approach, and that's been our uh, process. And taking into consideration what's happening with the APL, we've actually played nine of our youth players in our senior team this year, and we've done it deliberately. Um, and we've taken a few hits because of that policy, but the reality is we're playing nine of those players implementing what the APL is already asking us to implement. Yep. And I can happily say that we're heading towards the other end of the season, and in fact those youth players, probably five of them, will now earn senior contracts because we've invested in them, and they're actually scoring goals every week. Mm. Um, they're starting to score goals. So, you know, this, all this sort of concern or, or angst over whether it can work is just rubbish. Mm. It does work. Yeah. And, it, and it's we're already delivering it in this state. Yeah. And, so, and the, the people and the parents of, and the, the clubs I've talked to over the state, um, they need somewhere for their kids to aim for. You know, they need a club to aim for at that, at that higher level, whether they're under 12s or 14s or 16s. Within those regional areas and within Brisbane, they now have a, have a club and that, that, that APL club will have feeder clubs underneath it that, that those players can aspire to play in that APL competition. We've already got the situation where, we, regardless of what Mike said earlier about the splits on the Sunshine Coast, mm. the reality of what we've got actually on the Sunshine Coast is there's about 14 FA... Um, FFA Club. yeah. and affiliated clubs, and we've got about another 20 odd churches clubs. Yeah. But the reality is that um, we are being contacted directly and have been for some time by those clubs, excluding the zone, directly coming to us saying, We want to work with you. Mm. We want you to put, give us loan players, or we want, if you've got players that you think you can't use, or mm. can you come down and do a community day with us? Mm. Can you play a pre-season game and all mm. the proceeds go to the club for promotion? That's already happening. And we've, we've got uh, probably six or seven clubs now that we regularly work on. If they've got a charity day, we give them shirts, send down players. Yep. So, and we're doing that, and I'll probably get in trouble for this, but we're doing that regularly with the Churches League as well because we think they should be encompassed and brought into the whole what's happening as well because sure. there's 2,500 of them on the coast. Yep. And so, you know, we... we we don't see the problem. What we are actually seeing is a magnificent response to what we're actually doing. It's taken five years, yep. but it's happening. And so the APL is just a progression on that. You know, the, the runs are on the board for a lot um, of the clubs that have been putting in the work in the QSL. And those clubs need the recognition that they've already been doing this. What we're doing now is we're getting the rest of the pathway just lined up with where it should be. Sure. That's all we're doing. Yep. Anyway. Thanks, Noel. Pete. Um, if the um, National Review is talking about uh, having an under-20s, why is next year's Queensland APL not having a 20s? Because all the clubs I spoke to told me there wasn't enough quality at the moment. Um, we we uh, discussed that with a number of people, including our technical uh, coaches, and the feedback is that players that are... 18, 19 years of age at that state, if they're being identified, they're probably playing first team football or within that first team squad. And if they're not, they can play back in the under 18 competition uh, for players over age. So we, we may introduce it at a later stage, uh, but right now our technical people are telling us just wait a year or two. With uh, the licenses being given, what happens if my club has invested both ways and gone BPL and, Q and APL? Uh, my club gets offered a BPL license. Does he have to take it, or does he? Or can he wait? I think that's a discussion for Mike and Jeff at the moment. You know, there's some discussions that took place earlier today about that. Um, they still, they still got to get their heads together on a couple of things. So. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that'll come out in the next week or so. My last question, John, you were saying that uh, there's reductions in coaching fees coming up. When will they take effect? Will they take effect immediately? Because I'm going on a course next week. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> it, it, it I'd like to give my employer his money back. It, it'll be... Um, it will be uh, uh, come into place when the um, APL licences are granted. So can we open Sorry about the next week. Can we hold back the A-League refresher until the licences come into 
Oh, no, no, it won't apply to the A-League refresher, it'll only apply to B and C licences. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you the wrong answer for every question. <laughs> David's original point, yeah. and the recognition of both Mike and Jeff will suggest that the amount of work that's going to be involved, and it will be getting the ABR yep. Yep. next year. Yep. Yep. Has any consideration been given at the FAFQ level to suggest to Football Brisbane, with due respect to the amount of work they've done, mm -hmm. delaying the BPL introduction next year, especially as now that they're structuring uh, mirrors us, ours, the APL so closely. Yeah, listen, I think, as I just said, there's, there's some serious discussions that need to take place in the next few days. Um, and, you know, I think between Mike and Jeff and Dennis and, and uh, Ruben probably that uh, once those discussions have, have been made, you know, we'll make them public, I think. It, it, it's unlikely that we will delay. delay. It's been three years in the making, so our clubs expect I, us. I asked if, if I suggested that they suggested no, no, if we delayed, if we delayed, if it was delayed. Um, yeah, but you've got, if both structures, if APL and BPL are being announced in the same period, mm -hmm. and the football Brisbane structure is 12 to 18 plus opens and the same with the APL, yeah. Yeah. Um, Aren't we just creating confusion out there in the marketplace, which... No, very slow. I would have thought that everyone would have picked it up by now, Bruce, but, um, well, I would I would think so. The parents did last night. Um, clubs have... I've explained it to clubs. Uh, you know, there's no one that has, has said other, otherwise. Um, unless you can tell me. Oh, no, there's, there's been obviously a lot of misinformation for a lot of time. Yeah, I think there has. You know, I, you know I've, I've learnt that especially <laughs> over the last 16 weeks. Well, we, we, we've said consistently to clubs, every club in Brisbane should put an expression of interest in, every club in Brisbane should look at the APL and should make a decision that they believe to be in the best interest of their members and their players. And if, if that means they elect to go to the APL, that they will go with that blessing, uh, they'll be welcome to participate in, in, in as many Brisbane competitions as they're eligible for. They'll still be uh, Brisbane football clubs, even though their, their top sellers might not be playing in a competition. Um, but there, there's been no misinformation or disinformation uh, from football Brisbane. Our only concern has been with some of the peripherals, what's happening to RDOs, because we put a great deal of uh, uh, money uh, into, for example, coast development. Uh, we uh, subsidise the SAP program so it can run in Brisbane. Uh, we run coaching conferences. We have 500 players, young players every Sunday in our development programs. We offer free coaching courses to clubs. Uh, we just want a budget and plan for next year. So it's those peripheries that we're concerned with what's happening to the RDOs so we can plan. But, uh, but that, that, that's all we want to do, Mike. You know, there's been a lot of misinformation out there. Not, from, fo from, not from Football Brisbane. Well, we should be clear now where it's where it's at. Yep. Leap player pathway, we know where that is. That is um, APL, we know where that is. Hopefully. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of talk tonight, and uh, it's nice to see all sides pull together. Um, there's lots of issues to work through, and it will take a little bit of time. What I would like to ask is, there's going to be parents that are going to have questions, going to be kids have questions, mm. there's going to be coaches, there's going to be clubs, etc. Mm. And then you've got Mike and Jeff who are working through issues as well. So it's good everybody's going in one direction, but over the next maybe three to five years, is there going to be like a committee in Queensland that are going to help to provide support? Because that's going to have to be ongoing for a little while until the mm. dust settles mm. and everybody is pushing the one way. Mm. There's been some discussion about a working group uh, put together, and as far as Football Queensland's concerned, you know, we'll, we're happy to have a discussion about that. Um, but once again, this is all sort of breaking news, Kenny, this week. So, um, you know, we'll we'll go away from here and 
and put our heads together and see if we can come up with some solutions and hopefully for the football in Queensland we can come up with a solution that's beneficial to, to kids because that's what we're, we're trying to set up with the APL. So, um, you know, we had a, a, a great forum last night with uh, a lot of the JPL parents and, 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 and kids here um, and a number of other clubs that came um, and, you know, their they're, they're, they're understanding of, I guess, the national curriculum and the philosophy behind the APL is uh, is great. You know, they think it's a step forward. So, Well, I think the intent of everybody here is going in the right direction. So I think it's a positive start. Yeah, and it's, I'd like to thank everyone as well for coming tonight because, um, you know, it wasn't easy getting everyone together. But uh, I think uh, on, on the back of the fact that we all want to take a step forward with, with football here in Queensland, uh, I think it's great that we could get so many people from so, such a vast range of clubs and and, uh, and, I, and I thank John and Han and Emma for coming up uh, tonight um, to explain what they've been doing and uh, hopefully we can can uh, communicate you know a lot of positives in the next few weeks in relation to both the APL and, and the BPL and, uh, and, our, and our community competition so thanks Kenny and I'll, I might wrap it up there um, Thank you, as I said, for everyone coming. Um, can we get a copy of the presentation? We can get a copy of the presentation, Rob. Yep, no problem at all. Um, I think we may just hang around and have a bite to eat and, and uh, some water. So if you can do that, great. If not, then there, I haven't got any red wine, Mike, but uh, I'm sure someone has. So thanks once again.